again, just wanted to thank uh, Pastor Ferdi for welcoming me here to preach, and all of you. Uh, it's a great uh, uh, joy and privilege for me to come to preach to you, Rock City, in person. Since last time it was online, it just wasn't the same. Uh, so I'd love to, to be here in person uh, to see all your beautiful faces. Um, <clears throat> so I've actually been preaching through Acts uh, in my church as well, which is pretty helpful for me as a preacher since you've given me a text that uh, I've already preached. But this is actually one of, um, I, I reckon it's one of my favorite texts in, in all of Acts, so I feel quite privileged that you gave me this text. Um, and, and this is a text that uh, many commentators consider to be the key passage um, uh, of Paul's second missionary journey. So, you know, in, in, in Acts, Paul has three missionary journeys, and this is um, Paul's speech to the Areopagus in Athens. Uh, and this is considered, why this is an important text as well, many people consider this <clears throat> to be the text on how to contextualize the gospel. So that's what I'm going to be focusing on. Uh, I've called my sermon, Spirit-Empowered Contextualization. <clears throat> and so the first thing I did, when, as I was thinking about this this morning, I woke up and I thought, you know, I'm going to be preaching a, a, a sermon on contextualization, so I better practice what I preach. And so I reached into my wardrobe and I pulled out this black t-shirt because this is a Pastor Ferdy, this is what Pastor Ferdy always wears, right? This is, this is the uniform of the preacher here in Rock City. So I'm contextualizing the Rock City right now, but then I had to bring my own jacket as well because this is not enough for me. But, you know, just, 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 just so you know, right? Just so you know. Um, <clears throat> before, before I get into this passage, I want to, to share something with you. And then, I don't know whether Pastor Ferdi has pointed this out, but uh, I believe the mission statement of the whole book of Acts, if you find this in the first chapter, Acts 1.8, and it says this, uh, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So I think this is a really important verse to understand all of Acts because I really think that all of Acts, um, you know, there's lots of themes. I know that you've been focusing on the theme of kingdom. But for me, I really think that for me, the, the focus from this verse is about the disciples carrying out Jesus' command. Some people call this like the great commission of Acts, right? Uh, and, and, so, and so what we see here is one aspect of that mission in, in contextualizing the gospel. So let me just pray for us now as we begin and we'll dive into God's Word. Heavenly Father, we thank You that You are a speaking God. We thank You that Your Word is living, powerful, and active. And Father, that You have ordained the preaching of Your Word, Sunday by Sunday, to be the means by which You declare uh, Your Word, you, you speak Your Word into our hearts. And we know that even though I, I'm, I'm doing what is a human task, that Your Spirit delight to use the ordinary preaching of the Word to achieve extraordinary spiritual goals. And so, Father, we submit ourselves to you this morning. Holy Spirit, would you do your work in our hearts, that no one would leave this time together unchanged by your Word, your Gospel, for your glory and our joy. In Jesus' strong name, Amen. How... Do we preach the gospel to a culture that has no understanding of it? Sometimes we might think as we go about our work or our university, in our neighborhoods, we might think that the, the secular Australian culture, Aussie culture, is so opposed to it, sometimes so ignorant of it, that it feels almost impossible to proclaim the gospel to it. How are we to go about this? Now, while it is true that our culture is opposed to the gospel, it is no different to any human culture that is dominated by a rival worldview. So this is true as well for the Greco-Roman culture that the first Christians had to engage with. And in today's passage, what we see is Paul's encounter with the Areopagus in Athens. And I think this is arguably Paul's clearest and most extensive engagement with Gentile culture in the whole book of Acts. More specifically here, Paul is engaged with Greek culture. The culture of Athens was quite pluralistic, somewhat like ours, with a variety of religions and worldviews. And we see here that Paul engages with two influential Greek philosophies of the first century, and they are um, uh, Epicureanism, 
on one hand and Stoicism on the other. For those of us who, who have no idea what that is, I'll try to give you a brief intro. Epicureans are a type of hedonist. They believe that life is all about maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain. Stoics, on the other hand, are perhaps a bit like Buddhists in the sense that they believe it is best to be detached from all emotion. So as we observe how Paul engages with the Athenians, what I want to start with is just for you to observe, you know, you've been hearing sermons through Acts, so you can, you can see actually how different Paul's speech is when you compare it with the sermons that he preached to a predominantly Jewish audience. See, when, when preaching to Jews, you see that Paul can assume knowledge of the Old Testament. Whereas when he's preaching here to the Athenians, Paul does not assume they have any knowledge whatsoever of the Old Testament. And so what does he do? Paul then adapts his gospel presentation to the culture and the worldview of the Athenians. And this is what missionaries have been calling contextualization. And just to be clear, you know, all of us, in some way, are called to be missionaries. We are called to be witnesses, as we see in Acts 1 8. So just as Paul contextualized the gospel to the Athenians, we need to contextualize the gospel to Melburnians. And so there's much that we can learn from Paul's contextualization uh, to the Athenians. But before that, let me set the scene about what's going on in the story. So Paul here, at the start of the story, he arrives in Athens alone. Now, this is actually unusual for Paul. He is usually with a teammate, right? Now, when he arrives, Paul, we see that he's deeply distressed by the number of idols that he sees in the city. Now, Paul goes with his typical strategy. He starts in the synagogue. That's what he always does. He starts with the Jews and the God-fearers. But this time, all the action is not there. All the action is in the marketplace. And Paul engages in debate with Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. And we see that some of them mock him as um, uh, an ignorant show-off, just... just just to, to note that typically I use the CSV instead of the, the ESV. Let's see, what does this, the ESV say? Ah, uh, oh, so sorry, verse 18, it says, What does this babbler wish to say? Um, so that, that word... Uh, was actually, in, in the original Greek, was Athenian slang, uh, which lit literally meant cock sparrow. Uh, and some of them were curious about the gospel because they had never heard it before. Paul came across as a preacher of foreign divinities. So we're told that the Athenians and the foreign residents there spend their time hearing about new ideas. So you could say that these Athenians were a progressive people, kind of like Melbourne, and that Athens was a center of learning. So they bring Paul to this place, the Areopagus, which is both the name of the hill that it's on, sometimes it's called Mars Hill, hence some famous churches call their church that, as well as the name of the council that met on top of this hill. Now one commentator compared the Areopagus at the time in Greece to the, in, the intellectual might of the combined faculties of Yale, Princeton, and Harvard. That's literally the equivalent of Aeropagus back then. Uh, some commentators say that Aeropagus also had a role in approving the practice of different religions in Athens. Because you know, we, we have said before, Athens is pluralistic, multi-religious. So there's some evidence of them in history approving the use of land for Egyptian migrants to build a temple to worship Isis and Anubis. So if Paul was bringing a new religion, perhaps he had to be approved first by this Areopagus. Okay, so that's the scene, setting the scene. So let's go into Paul's sermon and his approach to gospel contextualization. So here's, here's my way of framing it. It's not the only way, but this is my way and it's three C's. Hopefully it's easy for you to remember. Three C's, connect confront Christ. This is my strategy, right? Connect, confront Christ. So firstly, 
connect. What do I mean by that? Paul first, in his speech, he finds points of connection between the gospel and the narrative of the worldview that he's engaging with, right? And, and you could say he's, he begins by building a bridge to the culture. Secondly, confront. Paul then finds points of opposition between the gospel and the narrative or the worldview he's engaging with. Right? You can say that he's now challenging the culture. And thirdly, Christ. Paul ultimately reveals that the answer that, you're, that they are looking for, whoever is looking for, is Christ. Christ is the fulfillment of whatever it is the culture is seeking for. And some, like the late great Tim Keller, have called this approach subversive fulfillment. Now, there's an, uh, an Aussie author and evangelist in Sydney called Sam Chan, who also teaches the, 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 the same three points in his book called uh, Evangelism in a Skeptical World. Uh, and he calls them resonance, dissonance, and fulfillment, which sounds a bit more technical. I think mine's easier to remember. So, so um, I've adapted some of his illustrations to explain these three moves. So, so, so he, he gives this example in the book, right? He says, imagine if you and your secular friend are having a glass of wine, right? It's okay to have wine in moderation. Um, and, and then resonance, it's, both, it's like both of you having a, a, a sip of wine together and you're nodding your head and you're like, hmm. Yes, mm, it's, mm, it's good wine. Uh, and, and then dissonance, dissonance would be, imagine in, in, you know, in the middle of this conversation, you're having a sip of wine together, and then you suddenly grab both cups and you just pour them out like that, right? Like imagine if that happens, right? That's dissonance. It's very shocking uh, what in the world is going on. So, and then fulfillment is then, you take the two glasses, put it on the table, and then boom, you take out like, some really expensive, I don't know much about wine, like some really expensive wine um, and, and from Barossa Valley or something. And, and, then, and then you fill both your glasses with it and say, hey, check this out. I've got an even better wine than, than what you gave you, that we have here, right? And that, in a nutshell, in an illustration, is what we're doing in these steps, right, of Connect Confront Christ. That's what sub- we're doing in Subversive Fulfillment. So Connect Confront Christ... Um, So what I'm going to do in this sermon is to try and show you how Paul does these three moves in this speech in the Oropagus, and then I'm going to apply this to one aspect of our secular Aussie culture, right? Just one, and you can do it with others as well. But just try to illustrate this principle, okay? So hopefully it it makes sense uh, to you. And and we're going to start with connect. I'm just going to read a couple of verses for us. So I encourage you to have your Bibles open in front of you, be they paper or digital. Verse 22 says, So Paul, standing in the midst of the Europeans, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. So how does Paul begin his speech? He begins by complimenting his audience, right? He commends them for taking religion very seriously. He observes many objects of worship throughout Athens and he focuses on one which says to the unknown God. So we we know, right, I said that people of Athens, they're pluralistic, they're multi-religious, so they want to honor all the gods, every single god that exists in the world, right? And just in case they miss out on one or two, here they have this alt, this idol, which says uh, to the god they don't yet know. So we can summarize this opening section with one sentence, what Paul's basically, what is his move here in his, in his sermon, which is like a sentence that says, uh, your zeal for religion is commendable. This is basically what, what he's saying, right? That's, that's the, the move that he's doing. Now let's look at another example of Paul connecting. So in verse 28, it says this, For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Right? So we can summarize this verse perhaps with a sentence, We are all God's children. That's, that's the move he's doing, right? And, and you notice, he, Paul here, he has no problem actually quoting the Athenian poets, right? He quotes the inscription on the altar that says to, a, to the unknown God. He quotes their poets, right? A non-Christian source that says, for we are also his offspring. So Paul obviously does not hold to their worldviews, 
right? He's distressed by the, the, the idols, but he has no problem with identifying that there's a kernel of truth in that worldview. Let me latch on to that and see if how it aligns with his Christian worldview. Okay, so I said before, I want to apply these three moves to, to contextualization in our secular society. How are we going to do that? <clears throat> so, um, so one, on one hand, the first century Greek culture is, is, is very different to our 21st century Australian culture, right? First century Greek culture is highly religious. 21st century Australian culture is secular and a-religious. The, the average secular Australian person has no interest in religion. However, I think there's a similarity. And that is that the secular Aussie is still a worshipper, even if they don't know it or even if they don't acknowledge it. Right? The Aussie and the Athenian are both worshippers. And they are also both worshippers of idols. The Athenians worship idols of gold, silver, and stone. But the Aussie tends to worship idols as, as well, and it tends to be more intangible. And I'm going to focus today on one idol of our secular culture, and that is the idol of sex and romance. I think Western culture, which includes Aussie culture, elevates sex and romance more than any culture on earth. Western culture turns sex and romance into an idol. On, on, but on the flip side, you can look at other cultures. Let's say Asian culture, which is my culture, African cultures, tends to do something different, which is turn family and marriage into an idol. But today we're going to focus on Australian culture. So that means that all of us who live here in Melbourne, we live in a culture that worships sex and romance. And this plays out in multiple ways, right? So the young man or, or woman you know, is told by the culture that they are a loser if they cannot find a partner. The teenager in school is told by the culture that you're a freak, right? If something is wrong with you if you have not lost your virginity. Schoolgirls feel pressure to share sexual photos of themselves so that they can get attention from boys, so they can get a boyfriend. Gays and lesbians who believe that their sexual orientation is actually, that, is, that should be the most central aspect of their identity. And we see this being perpetuated by sexualization of movies and marketing. I could go on and on and on. So this is our culture. How do we preach the gospel to Australian culture? So firstly, as we said, the first move is connect. So imagine, so you just imagine if Paul, you know, he went through, he went on a time machine and he just like popped into Melbourne and let's say somehow he learned English. Uh, and, and so he, you could imagine him, if he, he came to Melbourne, he gave a speech at Monash University next to my church and he says, you know, people of Melbourne, I see that you are people of love. For as I was passing through, I saw many slogans celebrating love, like love is love or love wins. But there are many different understandings of love. What is true love? Let me proclaim it to you. Now, just to be clear, I, I'm, you know, I'm being a bit extra with that. Like, I'm not advocating we do exactly that in those words. But here is my one-sentence summary for Connect, right? It is that we are all looking for love. I think that's a sentence that connects. It doesn't matter if your friend is atheistic or agnostic, lesbian or trans. We can all agree with this one statement. Who's going, to, who's going to disagree with that statement? Everyone is looking for love. Or if you can perhaps be more explicitly Christian, you can say, we are all created for love. We are created to love and be loved. Okay, so remember the first C is connect. Anyone remember what the second C is? Confront. Adrian's on the wall. Um, all right, let me get to verse 24. Uh, verse 24 says, The God who made the world and every, everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. 
So he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined the allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, yet he's actually not far from each one of us. So how does Paul confront the Athenians? Let me summarize his argument again in two sentences. The first sentence I'm going to use is, God is creator, and so therefore he does not live in man-made shrines or need human service. Now the first way that Paul confronts the Athenian worldview is actually in the first two words of his address here. What are those two words? The God. Right? The God. The Athenians had many gods. Zeus, Athena, Poseidon, Hera, Hera, sorry, and Ares, to name a few. But Paul speaks of the God. Right? The only true God. This God is the creator of the world and everything in it. Which I think is actually one of the questions in the New City Catechism as well, because I've been doing it with my five-year-old son. Um, <clears throat> unlike the Greek gods who need people to build temples and serve them, the true God is all-powerful and does not rely on anyone or anything. And the interesting thing about this point is that even though it was contrary to the pluralistic Greek pantheon of gods, Stoics, kind of, they kind of held a mediating position. Remember those two, the two audi- uh, people in the audience, Epicureans and Stoics? The, the Stoics, they believed in a plurality of gods, but they also believed in the God, right? A supreme God who was the creator and gave life to all beings. Okay, the second sentence. God is sovereign over the affairs of humanity for he wants to be in relationship with humanity. So this challenge, the Greek understanding of the, the ultimate being, the God, who, in cold, abstract, and intellectual terms. So in, according to Paul, the true God is a personal God who wants to be in relationship with us, right, with humanity. The Greeks thought of God as the, the logos, which you might be familiar with from John chapter 1, right, the divine word, the divine logic behind the universe. But what the Apostle John declares is Jesus, the Logos, had become sax, which is the Greek word for flesh. In Jesus, the Word became flesh. Verse 29 then, it says, um, Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. So here's the next aspect of his argument. God is not an idol. Right? Well, this is a point of confrontation with the prevailing Greek worldview. It's also a point of connection, interestingly, with the Stoics and the Epicureans. Right? I get a bit complicated. There's the kind of overarching Greek culture, but within that, there's this group of Stoics and Epicureans, right? Both the Stoics and the Epicureans were actually critical of the larger Greek culture, the idolatry of the broader Greek culture. So what this shows us is that there are elements in our Christian worldview which might confront one worldview on one hand, but actually connect with another worldview on the other. And yet Paul's point here, so, so let me just give you a real quick example of that. Oftentimes, it's easy for me to connect with a, a migrant from another culture because migrants from other cultures are typically religious. It's easy actually for me to strike up a conversation with someone wearing like in, in uh, a hijab, Right? Because I know that there's someone who's, who's, who's religious and they, and, and they have a point of connection that we believe that religion is important and God is important. Um, okay, so <clears throat> Paul's point here also exposes, as I said, the inconsistency of the Stoic and Epicurean worldviews, right? So what do they believe? They believe that, as I said, that there is a supreme divine logos, yet at the same time they also accept 
this pantheon of Greek gods. Right? There is one god and there is many gods. Right? They criticize the futility of idol worship and yet they still accept the plurality of Greek gods as a legitimate religious ex expression. Remember, they're the, the board that approves the religions, right? They still accept it. So Paul, what he's doing, he's pointing out there's some logical inconsistencies. You guys, the smartest in, in all of the land, Harvard, Yale, all together, but yet, do you realize you're logically incoherent? Right? And this is also something that we can do when we engage with worldviews, different worldviews that we encounter here in Melbourne. Okay, so application time. How do we apply this to our secular society that, that idolizes not Zeus and Athena, who probably the max they might appear in some Netflix series, but romance and sex? So remember we said firstly, connect. We can connect by saying we're all looking for love. And then we can confront by saying that true love cannot be found in sex and romance. That's not the right place to find True love, it's not going to ultimately satisfy. Now, in, and then you point this out. Isn't it interesting, this is what research is showing us, right? That despite being the most sexualized generations we've ever had, Gen Z and millennials, I'm an old millennial, uh, are reporting to have less sex than any previous generation, than the older generations. It's pretty consistent across the board. Despite sex being held up as this coveted idol people are having less sex than ever. Now, well, there's lots of suggested reasons for this. It might be increased in social media and video game usage or whatever. But sex is, is not the savior it's, it's advertised to be. Another reason, of course, is the widespread use of, of porn and porn exposure to younger and younger children. Our society is becoming increasingly sexually broken with porn promoting forms of sex that are increasingly violent, depraved, and dehumanizing. You've got reality TV shows, right? Like Love Island and Married at First Sight, which promote dysfunctional romantic relationships. So what do we say? We, as Christians, want to confront by saying this. True love cannot be found in sex and romance. Sexual romantic love will not ultimately satisfy Okay, so the three C's, right? Firstly, we got connect. Second, and the third one, Christ. Beautiful. Okay, let's go to verse 30. Verse 30 says this. <clears throat> the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. My one sentence summary, turn to the true God in worship, for he will judge the world through his chosen man, Jesus, whom God raised from the dead. Now, interestingly here, Paul does not speak of the cross. Do you notice that? Right? But if you think of the gospel outline, he does go from you know, those key phases, creation, fall, redemption, to, and new creation. But here, he focuses on the resurrection. He focuses on God's judgment instead of the cross and salvation. He also calls them to repent and turn to God. Okay, so application. How do we apply this to our sex-worshipping culture? Now, I think we can point to Christ by saying this. True love is sacrificial, not sexual. Right? In a statement, true love, greatest love, is sacrificial, it's not sexual. And it is found ultimately in the person of Jesus. Jesus' own words, John 15, 13. No one has a greater love than this to lay down his life for his friends. The greatest love that we can find in this world is not sexual. It is sacrificial. Jesus himself is the ultimate example of his own words. Am I right? When he died on the cross, he took upon himself all of our sin, including our sexual sin, 
our brokenness. Jesus was stricken so that we might be healed. And only in Christ then, the Christ crucified and resurrected Christ, can we find satisfaction that goes deeper than sex. Only in Christ can we find healing from all the sexual sin and brokenness that we have experienced in this fallen world. Only in Christ can we find an identity that is more secure than our sexual orientation or our romantic status. Only in Christ can we find a love that is unconditional. Right? Only in Christ can we find an identity that is unshakable. So true love is sacrificial, not sexual, and is found only in the person of Jesus. So, that's the lesson. Let's, let's try and recap, right? What does spirit-empowered contextualization look like? Three C's, connect, confront, Christ. How does Paul use it with the Athenians? He connects by saying, you Athenians, you, you are serious worshippers who recognize God. But he confronts by saying, God is not an idol. He is creator, sovereign, and personal. Christ. The way to worship God truly is by turning to the man, Jesus Christ, God's appointed judge. That's how he, that was his strategy. Now how do we do that here in Melbourne with Melbourneans? We can say connect one, one way, right? That's not the only way. One way is we can connect by saying we are all created for love. We are created to love and be loved. Confront. True love cannot be found in sex and romance. Sexual and romantic love will not ultimately satisfy our deepest longings. And then Christ, true love is sacrificial, not sexual. It is found ultimately in the person of Jesus. So, what was the result of Paul's carefully designed, contextualized gospel presentation? What was the result? Did everyone just, was there an immediate revival? Right? Did everyone like, straight away be like, let's break out some, some, some great songs like we had this morning, right? The breath in our lungs. And, oh, yeah, is that what they did? Let's look at verse 32. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom were also were Dionysus, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with him. So that we can see here in this short segment three responses. And this time it's three R's. Okay, what are the three R's of the responses? Firstly, rejection. Many Athenians considered this idea of resurrection absolutely ridiculous and they began to ridicule Paul. Two, respect. Some of them, they had a level of respect for Paul and his message, so they were open to hearing from him again. And the third R is repentance. Some of them, they obeyed Paul's call to repentance, right? Dionysus, the Europagite, one of the Europagite, Right? One of the council members of the Oropagus, the, the most elite court uh, and, and university of the land, like he was converted. A woman named Damaris. So um, I'm not sure if, if Pastor Ferdi pointed this out, but Luke in his writings very focused on the role of women in Jesus' ministry. So here is a woman named Damaris. And some others also repented, believed in Jesus, and joined Paul. Now, notice another thing. Those who converted... It wasn't just they believed in their hearts, oh yeah, this is true, and then they just went on their merry way, right? No, these men and women who repented, what did they do next? They, 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 how do we know repentance is real? We know because they joined Paul and presumably formed a church. The New Testament knows nothing of a kind of like a personal salvation where it's just me and my homeboy Jesus, right? Those who are saved 
are always saved into a community called the church. So three responses, three R's, rejection, respect, and repentance. So it is an important reminder to us today, all of us, witnesses of Rock City Church, witnesses for Jesus, that even if we perfectly contextualize the gospel to the absolute, you know, if you went for, for a test in a Bible college, they give you 99%, you know, a uh, 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 mark. There will always be those who reject it. But we should take heart because there will also be those who will repent and believe. There will also be others who respect what you're saying. They're not hostile, they're respecting what you're saying. And they are open to hearing more, should, and these are those whom we should pursue. So, maybe you're sitting here today. I don't know all of you, I haven't met all of you. I don't know about some of you are maybe watching on a, on, a, on a stream. And perhaps you're listening to me today and you are not a Christian. How will you respond to the gospel that you've heard today? Will you reject the gospel? Or do you respect Jesus enough to continue hearing more? Or are you willing to repent today and put your trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord? And it is my sincere prayer for everyone who's listening that if you have not already, that you will respond with repentance. And if you'd like to talk to me, I'd love to talk to you um, after the service. And for those of you here today, uh, if you are a Christian, let me finish with this. What can we learn from this passage about Paul's heart for the loss? Remember early in the passage, we, we read this. He was deeply distressed because he saw that the city was full of idols. Now, as you go about your city, like for me, it's Monash. I think this is Whitehorse, right? Or, 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 or just broadly in, in our city of Melbourne. Do you feel the same as Paul? Right? As you see, as you go about your day in your workplace, as you go to buy, buying stuff in shops and supermarkets, as you see the monuments to our culture's idols, are you deeply distressed by them? Is your heart broken for Melbourne as Paul's heart was broken for Athens? And you know who else had his heart broken for his city? It was our Lord Jesus. Let me read to you what Jesus said and did. Luke 19, it says this, As he approached and saw the city, he wept for it, saying, If you knew this day that would bring, what would bring peace, but it is hidden from your eyes. For the days will come on you when your enemies will build a barricade around you, surround you, and hem you in on every side. They will crush you and your children among you to the ground. And they will not leave one stone on another in your midst because you did not recognize the time when God visited you. So brothers and sisters, may our hearts be broken for our city as Jesus, our Savior, was. And may the Spirit empower us to faithfully contextualize the timeless gospel to the culture and times that we live in today. Let's pray.